Bodies, borders, coming apart, resistance and rebirth. This week on the show, I sit down with acclaimed author Arundhati Roy to discuss her latest novel, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Dear Comrade Azad Bharatiya Garu, My comrade Suguna knows to send this letter to you when she hears that I am no more. As you know, we are banned underground people and this letter from me you can call as underground of underground. Thank you, comrade, for reading this. How to tell a shattered story by slowly becoming everybody. No, by slowly becoming everything. That's the line that is sticking with me from the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, the latest book by one of our favorite guests, Aaron Dutty Roy. She's been here often with her writing on capitalism, nationalism, solidarity, resistance. We'll talk about all those things again today, I'm sure, but I'm especially excited and happy to be celebrating her first novel since her debut novel, The God of Small Things, over 20 years ago, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. Welcome. Welcome back, Arundhati. It's great to have you. Thank you, Laura. I want to thank you for this book. For nothing else than the title, Upmost Happiness. We're going to get to happiness. <laughs> we need it. Is it a happy thing, though, for you to come here to the United States? What do you see when you come here? Well, um, the things that are happening in the world are so... Um, there's something so similar and yet so different. And I'm always wary about homogenizing the whole thing. And equally, to, to, to not see the connections is also difficult, you know. So for me, uh, I think we're just tra traveling through uh, a time where our old means of trying to understand what's going on are proving to be inadequate. Mm. And we, uh, we're all searching for some way of, 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 of even trying to see a little bit ahead. Yeah. You dedicate your book to the unconsoled, and, and I believe that we are unconsoled in this moment. But I do worry that we in the United States, as, as you've alluded, become inured, become maybe muddied in our seeing and our thinking, because there's so much coming at us at all times. Insofar as you have a take on what's happening here, where do you think we are? And then obviously I want you to talk about home and where India is, because India we barely see at all. The, the thing is that people spend so much time uh, mocking Trump or waiting for him to be impeached. And the danger with that kind of obsession with a single person is uh, that you don't see the system that produced him, isn't it? You don't see that, uh, obviously, you know, there was something about those 10 years of Obama's presidency that created Trump, you know? And uh, if, if we just 
keep obsessing about this one person without seeing what would happen. What would happen if he wasn't there tomorrow and Mike Pence came? Would it be better, you know? And uh, the, the kind of havoc that has been created in the world, when I think about it now, you know, between Europe and America, increasingly, the simple truth is that these economies can only function by selling the weapons that they manufacture. Weapons which you cannot even imagine that the human mind can conceive of, you know. And they are doing the selling and we are doing the buying. And to keep uh, that economy going, you need a world at war or almost at war or just about to go to war or whatever it is, you know. So uh, I, I think still, if you look at, I mean, forget, forget the past, you know, but just look at it from 9-11 onwards. How many countries have been destroyed? Europe is now in chaos, also because of the refugees and so on. But what is creating it? You know, how is it possible to continuously believe that you can destabilize country after country after country and anything good is going to come of it? Is India destabilizing or stabilizing in a scary way? India, it's, it's hard to say. This year is going to be a, a, a this year is going to be a very very important year. How so? Uh, because the elections are coming next May, and we've had uh, a situation where somehow since 1925 the goal of the Hindu nationalists was achieved in 2014 when. Uh, Modi came to power with this absolute majority. And in a way, I was grateful for the absolute majority because there wasn't anyone else to blame. You know, there isn't anyone else to blame for the, for the chaos that has been unleashed. But uh, what, what is very worrying is um, that, Again, you know, I keep saying you have to look, we have to find ways of keeping up uh, our understanding with what's going on because, say, two years ago, he appeared on TV at 10 o'clock at night and announced that 80% of Indian currency was illegal from the next morning. Now, that was like taking a baseball bat and breaking every single citizen's spine. They called it demonetization. That's right. We don't even have a word in any Indian language for it. But then when you do that, regardless of the economic implications, what you're doing is you're sending a message saying, I can control you at all points, every single one of you. Now there's another huge thing which is about to, I mean, which they are trying to bring into legislation called the Aadhaar card, where every citizen's private information, biometrics, all of it is going to be put on a unique identity card. Now, as you know, these databases are being hacked. People's private information is being bought and sold. Information is gold now, you know. And that is a form of surveillance and control that is there forever. Once they've got it there, you can't undo it. You know, so these are these are things which are impossible to wrap your head around. You have uh, the whole new media now. For example, I'm not even talking about Facebook. I'm not even talking about Twitter. I'm talking about a messaging service called WhatsApp, which is very very big in India. And at one point, all of us were. You know, we used to use it because it's not, it's encrypted and the information is not available to uh, the authorities. But now what, you have these kind of WhatsApp farms, you know, where uh, fake news, fake videos, v videos that are meant to create communal conflagration are deliberately being sent around. So, so you have a situation where the only way now that the BJB is going to win the election again, is to create massive communal strife between Hindus and Muslims, between Dalits and Muslims and so on, or 
what they call a limited war with Pakistan, as you know, both are now nuclear neighbors. But the systematic um, sort of administri and administering of hatred, a manifesto of hatred is the basis of these people, you know. We wonder about that here in the U.S. too. Once that hatred has been unleashed, is the individual required if Modi doesn't get elected or doesn't get an absolute majority in 2019? Is that the end of it? I mean, there no. was a, an eight-year-old girl kidnapped, raped, and murdered, Asifa Bano, recently. We can talk about who did it, etc. But what killed her was a congregation of factors um, that speak to what's already happening. How do you reel that back? The thing is that there are so many different kinds of rape, right? You, you might have a group of maniacs who rapes and kills a child, but do they then have huge processions of people supporting them, you know? Do they have demands that they be released or that the investigation doesn't continue or that the investigation is handed over to people whom the the majority community quote unquote trust you know i mean the uh, idea has happened in this case yes has happened in this case but has it keeps happening i mean there was a another person who was arrested for rape in haryana a, a sort of godman there were massive protests in his favor there's another godman called asaram bapu he was convicted of rape the, there had to be security alerts in three states because it was now a question of people supporting him. You see, it's not just that one community rapes and the other doesn't. It isn't that. I'm talking about the public support that comes out. I'm not talking about... And then there's a sort of ritualistic, almost satanic element to it. You know, it isn't just rape and kill, but there's something so terrible about it that you wonder, what is it? You know, what is it... And you read it, I mean, she's one child, but it's happening all over now. And, and sometimes I wonder, is this something, you know, is, is, is this something, something that requires the sacrifice of the most beautiful thing, which is a little girl, you know? Is there something more to it than just carnal lust and brutality? But... It's very. Uh, well, is there? How do you I, see it? I don't know. You know, because uh, because we are living in this world of um, you know feudalism and uh, you know all kinds of uh, strange beliefs. But what I, I I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. I don't know how to think about it. You know, none of us know. Like we are all unable to unable to understand how things have, have come to this. Except you are able to talk about it because this entire book is you talking about it. True. It's me thinking about it, you know, and um, mourning about it and then finding, finding how beautiful, how much beauty still does exist in the saddest places, how much strength and how much power still does exist, you know. I... Uh, I have, in the last 20 years, spent time in what people would consider to be the darkest and most hopeless places, but they have not been, you know, dark and hopeless. And there are people, uh, there are people uh, struggling against it, fighting against it, speaking against it. The, and I, I don't mean in a shallow, sort of sloganeering way, but as a way of life, you know, as a, as a deep and dense understanding, a, a, very, a most varied and wide understanding with poetry, with music. Uh, and each of these things has, has such a deep history, you know, such a deep history. I mean, the poets that, that, that ordinary people in the book uh, recite and and love and go 
whose shrines they go to to lay flowers. You know, you, you look at the power of that, you know, people who don't forget their poets, however much violence is done. So... Is that what brought you back to fiction? Uh, what brought me back to fiction was just that I had become, uh, you know, like, as I keep saying, like a sedimentary rock, you know. I had these layers and layers and layers of looking at things. Of course, in the non-fiction, I have argued, I've fought, I've, 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 I've uh, you know, driven myself and other people crazy. <laughs> but the complexity of it, you know, the humor, the love, the maverickness, the poetry, as I say, the all, all of that was accumulating too, you know, and I, I've been writing it for, for 10 years, but very slowly, you know, without, I, I, I mean, unlike in my nonfiction, when I write fiction, I'm not in a hurry. I, I was not interested in writing just about one particular class or, you know, just this whole ocean of languages and beliefs and religions and intimacies and anarchies and of course the the fact is that while we are facing majoritarianism which is actually bordering on fascism not european fascism our own variety of it yet india is a land of minorities you know a, 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 a land which whose people are divided you know formally into castes and religions and ethnicities and we while while people uh, look at india and think it's anarchic the anarchy is in the traffic but society lives in a grid you know and this book is about people who somehow are off grid and through their off gridness you shine the light on the grid and you and you look at it and you wonder about it you come back to bodies. Bodies are at the heart of this story. And I encourage everybody to read it. This is worth the read. Bodies in which there are riots. Bodies at war with themselves. There's a beautiful passage about the riot is in us, uh, in the transgender community that you depict here. Is that where we find our connection, coming back to our bodies, even as our bodies are such targets, many of us? Well, I don't think we can ever underestimate the importance of our bodies, you know, and the, and the uh, ecstasies and the agonies <laughs> that they go through. There are these borders that run through all the characters. Some run through their bodies. In the case of Anjum, who's in Urdu, they call her a hijra, which is a, 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 a woman trapped in a man's body, you know, and she lives with other people like her for a while in the Khwabga. All of them have a sort of incendiary border running through them, but all the other characters do too, in some way or the other, you know. And eventually, uh, eventually when they, when, I mean, Anjum, Anjum, of course, survives the massacre of Muslims that took place in Gujarat in 2002. She's not only a hijra, you know, all of them and all of us have so many identities. She's also a Shia and she survives the, she's, she's, she's caught up in the massacre because she's a Shia and a Muslim, but she escapes because she's a hijra. And so eventually she, she moves out of her little community in the old city of Delhi to a graveyard nearby, and she slowly begins to uh, enclose the graves of her relatives, and finally she starts a guest house there, and it becomes a home for what she calls the falling people, you know, people who have been driven out or fallen out in so many ways. And, and, and so, the book, it's, it's about borders inside the body, it's about borders within communities, it's borders in countries, the border between life and death, the borders between humans and animals. There are lots of animals who are, who are very important in the book. 
and the cemetery where they all finally live when you actually look at who lives there who has died there and who has buried there is buried there and how it's a revolution you know looking forward you just asked us you encouraged us to look forward there's a somewhat cynical passage in the book where a, a letter is being written and the phrase is used that it, you know one should really come to a more efficient um, uh, quantum of hope is that what it is <laughs> yeah. what's our efficient quantum of hope in this time what's yours well this is a uh, you know obviously this is a letter that Tilotuma writes to this I mean she's she's writing these peculiar and strange letters and that particular f uh, moment she's talking about the mothers of the disappeared in in uh, Kashmir <clears throat> and she says you know I mean in Kashmir there are about 10,000 disappeared there are mass graves uh, you've called it the most well it's been called the most militarized place on the planet yes and uh, so she's saying what kills these mothers is, is hope, you know, the hope that one day they will show up again. <clears throat> so she's, uh, she's just, you know, writing this very many layered meaning letter. Maybe cynical is the wrong word. Yeah, but it's, it's not cynical, it's just she, she's a very strange and somewhat unhinged She's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see, I have, uh, you know, one of my books of essays was dedicated to those who have learned to divorce hope from reason. Mm -hmm. So I don't, uh, I don't think that uh, we should be reasonable, you know, and I don't think that hope does have anything to do with reason, because if it did, we wouldn't have had any revolutions, even the ones that have gone wrong, mm -hmm. you know. I think it would be very, very sad if we just looked around us and then felt hopeless, you know. And I often find that, uh, for example, you know, some years ago I had spent f a few weeks inside the forest with armed guerrillas. And, and you imagine, you know, fighting with their backs against the wall, even just last week, 37 people were just gunned down. And now it comes out slowly, the story, that it wasn't what the police are saying it was. And it was whatever it is, you know. Even if they were armed militants in an ambush and killed, you have to ask why are 17 and 18-year-old girls taking to arms, you know. There has to be something very, very wrong, right? But when I spent time there, it certainly wasn't grim. It certainly wasn't uh, hopeless, you know, because people sometimes just don't have a choice, you know, and then they fight. I think the hopelessness comes when we're confused and we don't know what to do, which is, which is absolutely understandable, you know. But Maybe we put our hope in the wrong places. You've been writing a lot about democracy and using the phrase demon crazy. Hmm. Are we crazy to put our hope in democracy elections? Well, right now at this point in time, you know, uh, I am not one, uh, though I have been one of those people who has all this time said how little difference there is between the various political parties. But today in India, we are facing a situation where if the BJP comes back in 2019, I don't think there's going to be anything left of what we thought of with all its flaws. It's not that you be voting for a friend, but just for an en the enemy that you want to have, you know. So I don't think we can afford to leave any spaces unchallenged and unfought, including the elections. But if all of us think that by defeating Modi or by impeaching Trump, things are going to be okay, we got to have 
some extra iodine every night. <laughs> well, we hope that you'll come back again very soon. Thank you for another gorgeous, beautiful, powerful book. The Ministry of Utmost Happiness is just out in paperback. Get yourself a copy. And you can find all our interviews with Arundhati over these many years, it feels not like now, um, at our website. That's lauraflanders.org. Mm -hmm.